Um, why critical minerals? Um, so many of the issues we talk about today, both in a positive sense in terms of generating excitement, whether it's in the tech world and the entrepreneurial world, whether it's in terms of geopolitics, but also uh, these technologies where there's concern about supply chains, uh, about security, um, are uh, really today linked ultimately to critical minerals. The raw, these are raw materials that are needed for the functioning of semiconductors, batteries, electric vehicles, undersea cables, satellites, uh, drones, you name it. Any number of uh, uh, cutting edge technologies today are increasingly uh, using and dependent upon a suite of critical minerals. Some of them you will know, uh, gold, silver, copper, lithium, of course, very uh, important for batteries, tin, lead, manganese. But some of them, of course, are rare earth minerals, and I won't uh, bore you with all of them. How many people here can name a rare earth element? We have one person here who remembers his periodic table. Um, but, uh, you know, it's things like uh, lanthanum, terbium, holmium, there's a whole suite of um, uh, rare earth elements also which are increasing in importance. And this came to the fore a few years ago when China instituted a unilateral uh, ban on the export of some of these rare earths to uh, Japan. Um, today, uh, we have with us um, uh, Susana Malcora. She's the former foreign minister uh, of Argentina. Uh, she previously worked for many years at the United Nations, including uh, at the office of the UN Secretary General. Uh, previously, she worked in the private sector and has a background uh, in education in, as an uh, engineer. Uh, also joining us today, we're very privileged to have uh, Jorge Quiroga, who is the former president of Bolivia. He was previously vice president for a, a, a term, a finance minister, uh, and also interestingly has a background as an in, uh, industrial engineer. And we were discuss talking just before this panel, and a little bit of trivia, we have two, perhaps two of the few Latin American leaders uh, who have both worked for IBM at various points in their life. Um, so in, in interesting uh, anecdote. Um, let me start by asking uh, both of you, and uh, maybe we can start. Uh, we can maybe start with uh, Senor Malcora and then um, uh, Hiro, uh, Jorge Quiroga. Um, on um, you know, there's a lot of excitement around critical minerals uh, and mining, uh, their exploitation, their processing, their ex uh, and, and their export uh, as a source of revenue for many uh, countries, including yours. Talk a little bit about what are some of the um, uh, opportunities you see in those countries, in your countries. Uh, I believe combined you have about six billion dollars of exports currently from mining, um, and that's set to possibly double or triple in the coming years. Uh, what are some of the opportunities you see uh, here for uh, in, in the critical mineral space? Well, thank you, and, and let me start. This is the first time I participate in a panel. Let me start thanking ORF for inviting me and telling you that it's great to be back in Kigali after quite a few years, so I, to find a beautiful city even be more beautiful. Let me go to the point you made. Uh, people sort of see this as a, and the title of the panel is, a gold rush. And one needs to be very, very careful when considering gold rushes, because they don't necessarily end well. Uh, we are talking about Argentina, Bolivia, Latin America. I will argue this is not a regional issue, it's a global issue, it's an issue that is totally equivalent in, in, in Africa. So even though we are going to speak about our experiences, it's a larger question than the one we have before us. And the first question is, are we going to be able to step up and treat this opportunity not as a commodity-based old-fashioned approach, but to construct a different model that will allow for countries like Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, many in this part of the world, to participate in the supply chain in a manner that is richer than just providing raw material. And there are significant uh, uh, questions about that, because if you put uh, the production closer to the mineral a place where you get it, is an effective and efficient, it costs a lot. So everything indicates that you should be moving upwards the, the supply chain closer to the production sites. So how do we share, how do we find a way to share the benefits of the production without necessarily being a, able to produce in our own countries? So in my view, there is a need for a different approach 
a, a new, a, a different thinking on how to uh, not only uh, ex extract, and we can talk about how to extract also, but to export in a, a opportunity sharing approach between the ones who buy and the ones who sell, which then will really bring, bring added value and the numbers will be higher than those ones that you mentioned. Uh, Senor Quiroga, uh, what, what, uh, how do you see, in Bolivia again, people know of Bolivia as a source for lithium, it's a large, uh, but of course there are many other minerals as well. How do you, do you see this now uh, going forward as, as an opportunity for your country? Well, and uh, I'd also like to begin by, by thanking uh, Rwanda ORF, ORF for having us here. In my case, it's my first time in Rwanda. I know many here have come from afar. I guarantee you I have flown the longest of anybody. <laughs> that happens when you fly from a landlocked country in the middle of South America to a landlocked country in Africa. There's several stops and it takes a while. And I certainly come from the highest. The airport where I live at home is 4,000 meters. Uh, La Paz, it's the only place in the world where the great Messi has never scored a goal. He has one last chance in September when he comes in. So stay tuned and watch and see if, he, uh, if he's able to do that. Uh, is, is the home court, the home field advantage that, that we have. Uh, well, when, when you come here, you, you pack, of course, and when you go through the airport, the first thing they ask you is, are you carrying any batteries in your suitcase? You can't put batteries in the suitcase. No, you have them in the backpack. And just go check your backpacks or your briefcases tonight. How many do you have? I have seven. The two phones, the iPad, the iPod, the Kindle, the watch, and the recharger. So seven lithium batteries, not from Bolivia, unfortunately. The lithium in Bolivia is on the ground. Uh, it's coming from, from elsewhere. So I'll, I'll give you, Drew, my perspective based on history, the battery, the tennis battery game that's being played right now, and the challenges for Latin America and our region. Unless you think this only applies to Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, let me tell you, you can replace lithium for nickel or manganese or cobalt, and you can find countries in Africa where these principles uh, will sound very, very similar. History, we have a lot of scars in Latin America, as you do in Africa. A mythical book called The Open Veins of Latin America, of the gringos and the Europeans taking our blood, our, our mining products, our gas, our energy, and we never went up the value added chain. It seemed like a cycle that prices go up, we sell, we spend the money, prices go down, the bus comes down, the bus comes, uh, comes around, and you have the problems that you always face, and we're in, in one of those cycles again. So here we are, after all those cars, and in my country we had a lithium company that came in the 90s that was kicked out. We had another one from Germany that was kicked out in 2018, 19, because the lithium is in Potosí where a lot of the mining came, and supposedly the Spanish took so much silver from Potosí that you could build a bridge from Potosí to Spain all across the Atlantic. That's how much silver. So there's a lot of scars like you have in, in Africa. Now, and batteries. I don't want to take you through a technical disquisition on, on how batteries are made, but this is a, it's like a tennis game between an Ayatollah on one side and Djokovic on the other one. That's how batteries, generally speaking, work. I say the Ayatollah, I don't know if it's Khomeini or Khamenei, it's Khomeini on one side, because you have the, uh, the cathodes, they gotta have the Khomeini, cobalt, manganese, and nickel on one side of the tennis net. On the other side, you have Djokovic with graphite on the anode. And the balls, the balls are the lithium, and they don't have to go over the net, they have to go through the net, through the separators, through the electrolytes, and the lithium has to flow, and that's how you get batteries to provide the energy. And you need all of those to, to make a, a good battery, no matter how small it is. And you know, this is a car nowadays, and it's driven everywhere except uh, in, the, in the countries that have the lithium. So that's, that's how the cycle works, and that's what uh, the, the minds that we have. What is the difficulty right now? While Europe talks, and the US has a misnomer called Inflation Reduction Act, which is subsidies for EVs. That's a complete misnomer on the naming. And Europe is fighting with the U.S. Silently, China has been winning that game by a long shot. If you look at all, everything I mentioned, the cobalt, the manganese, the nickel, the graphite, the lithium, they control 20 to 40% of the production. But if you look at the refining, they control between two-thirds and three-quarters of the refining of each of the products that goes into a battery. 
and therefore they are manufacturing two-thirds of the battery cells in the world, in China. And Neil Ferguson, great historian from uh, economic historian, just wrote a, an article that woke up everybody, the ones of us that follow that, knew that China is exporting more than half of the electric cars in the world. So they are getting that advantage, as Susana mentioned, uh, in terms of um, having the first mover advantage on, on the refining. So the question is, what do we do? I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, what do we do in, in, in this regard? Um, the three of us, Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, have about, depending on what study you believe, it's kind of like poker, you know. You, you keep your cards close to the vest. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Uh, we have about 60, 70% of the world's uh, lithium. But in Latin America, we preach a good game on integration, but we're awful at playing it, except on the front line of a European soccer team. The only place where South Americans play well together when it comes to integration is in the front line of Barcelona or whatever, Manchester, pick your team. You always have Argentinians, Brazilians, and everybody playing well together. Not so much on trade. It would require the three of us to do exactly uh, what Susan is saying. Are we going to reproduce one more time the boom and bust cycle of having the lithium be shipped to China and come back in all kinds of batteries, or are we be able, will we be able to create from Antofagasta in Chile all the way down to Rosario, a belt, no Amazon, by the way, you don't have to, there's no forestation, deforestation issues there. Uh, that has good wind, good solar power, you need massive amounts of energy, you have good geothermal, you have good gas in Argentina, we used to have gas in Bolivia, we ran out, great hydro, because we have the mountains in, in, in between. Can, uh, can we create a belt where the three of us form like an OLEC, not an OPEC, but an OLEC of, of lithium regionally, and say, yes, I will export the lithium to whoever wants to buy it. And by the way, it'll probably be China, no matter what the U. And talk to the U.S. and Europe, say, why don't you come invest and set up in this belt that we're trying, and we'll give you a better price or a tax rebate. What does it take to not once again replicate the boom and bust cycle in Latin America by creating that belt? And if we're able to, in the next few years, do that. I can tell you right now, this, I don't want to get into the politics, the current governments in those three countries are competing to see who's more nationalistic, which is not the best way to do this. They have elections in Argentina, we'll have them in Bolivia in two years, we'll see how that goes, but if we seize this opportunity, we can create, the, we can create and leverage the lithium, and maybe instead of having the Gulf states buy all the soccer players and all the soccer teams, maybe we can in Argentina and Bolivia one day buy them all, and then Messi can come and, play and stay and, uh, and play in our, in our part of the world. Well, th thank you for that, that wonderful exposition and the explanation uh, of from how a battery works to what are some of the challenges. If, if I can just ask you both a, a, a follow-up. Could you speak a little bit, you know, you, you've laid out what needs to be done. What are some of the challenges to attracting, I would, I would say sort of three things that, that come to mind at least, and perhaps there are more, attracting that investment in the processing and manufacturing, you know, so, so it's not just about the resource extraction, bringing some of, some of that closer home, uh, or to, to diversifying at least sources uh, of that so, it, so that supply chains are not um, uh, monopolized. Secondly, making sure that the, uh, domestically you don't have a Dutch disease type problem, uh, sort of in, or, you know, inequities and, and, and um, volatility that, that results from an over-dependence on, um, uh, on, on, on resource extraction. And finally, the environmental concerns, which I know has, has been an issue. How do you overcome some of these hurdles? So maybe start, starting with you. Well, uh, they are all complex issues, but you have to tackle them. The first thing that any investor will require is predictability. So you need to set up uh, regulatory frameworks that are uh, uh, enabling frameworks, but at the same time, take into account the considerations that you just raised. Most of the time, the places where these uh, rare materials are have uh, local communities that have their stake, their views. You need to engage them. You need to find ways to uh, extract the material in a, in a manner that is environmental friendly. That means that probably you don't go for the lowest cost to extract it, but for the best approach to do it. So it requires, first of all, regulatory frameworks that are clear and stable, that go beyond political cycles. And I totally agree with the president that 
a view that has a regional perspective will go a long way to get that predictability, uh, although so far we haven't been able to do it. The second thing is to bring the sustainability both in terms of the planet, but in terms of social sustainability for the local communities. And unless you put as part of the new model that you are developing these ideas into motion, it will be hard to make this a successful story for everybody. And we have the opportunity, and the president described that very well. We, we know history, we know what has happened, we don't want to repeat, and we have something very valuable in our hands, as much as Africans do with many other uh, raw materials here, we need to really make that value clear and exercise our, our bargaining power to set up those frameworks that are acceptable to our societies and give us all the benefit from a financial and economic perspective. Um, yeah, Druva, thank you. Uh, what Susan has said is uh, right, right, spot on. Uh, you need rule of law and not rule of the jungle. If you want to bring an investment to Africa or Latin America or anywhere, you need a level of predictability. Uh, a friend of mine says that, um, you know, we have Latin American political leaders that become mythical. They, they, they have, you write books about them. Fiesta del Chivo in Dominican Republic, uh, Fujimori in Peru, and we have all this Chavez in Venezuela. And he said, how come nobody knows Swiss government officials? You know, it's kind of boring and predictable and developed, and nobody writes books about them. No, they're not entertaining like we have. Many times we take, uh, well, in the U.S. seems like they're doing that too. Reality TV onto politics seems like we do that um, a lot in, in our part of the world. So I think you, you need that long term. Uh, second point you mentioned is the people in the country have to feel the benefit. I'll give you one example. Peru is a country that is about three times the population of mine with 10 levels, 10 times the level of exports in mining, but 30 times the problems. In Bolivia, we have a system of cooperatives that are individuals that gather around 100, 500, and they get the concession, and they run the mines, and they share in the revenues, and they invest in their soccer teams, and they do very well. They're like small private entrepreneurs that gather around, and it makes it much more sustainable economically and socially when people are feeling the benefit. Uh, same thing we did with, with gas. With gas, you have a revenue sharing system on the region that it comes in, and also we apportion a part of the gas revenues when it's dwindling now, but when we had it, that went to indigenous communities. We are famous in Latin America for conditional cash transfer programs that were invented. They were very effective. They were even copied in New York where basically the government, instead of somebody with corruption and mismanagement trying to build and provide the services, you provide the cash directly to the mother, so long as, usually the mother, the family, shall we say, but in Latin America, it's usually the mother, so they can send the kids to school, they get good grades, and they get the money. That way, the kid doesn't have to choose between shiny shoes and, or going to school. We have, we have those types of social cushions that, that have worked uh, very well. And on the environmental things, I can tell you Latin America, we're not perfect, but we have good standards and we've worked with the World Banks and the IDBs of the world and, and Western companies and there are environmental standards that are sound. That is the issue with China. China is the number one trade partner for everybody in South America. South of the Panama Canal in Latin America, we're all Chinese because we all export energy, food and minerals. That's what China, China is buying at ever-increasing volumes, at ever-increasing prices, or it seemed like it. So they are the number one trade partner. Uh, that's why when we have American friends who come and tell you, Huawei, no way, out of the way, <laughs> that's not real for, for us. Uh, it, it is, China is the number one trade partner. The president of Ecuador is a banker who would be called a right-wing government official. He just signed a free trade agreement with China because unfortunately the US and Europe are not open for business, despite all the preaching. So that is the reality. What is the, the challenge here? China is not very good at environmental or labor standards. And free trade agreements are the ones that typically establish and strengthen rules vis-a-vis -vis environmental and labor standards. When you do them with the US 
and the EU when you're doing with China, not necessarily so. So um, when we get to this G20 summits, I understand all the talk will be about what's happening in Europe, deservedly so, and the Taiwan Strait and what have you. But by the way, while the, while, you know, uh, Susana knows this very well, Mercosur, Europe would say Mercosur, the South American countries, you have to get together and negotiate with Europe. Well, they did. They signed an agreement. And then Europe said, no, no, Bolsonaro burns the forest. Okay, out goes Bolsonaro in Brazil. Here comes Lula. No, now it's whatever. The excuse keeps changing. But basically, if the US and Europe uh, have turned protectionist and not very open to migration, then do not complain too much about China uh, taking advantage and seizing the opportunity in South America and in Africa. We have five minutes, and I do want to get in a few questions. So if uh, you could maybe, yes, please. And if you could please introduce yourself as well. And, and uh, make it a question, if you can. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Dominique. Uh, I'm from Ivory Coast, uh, living in Ghana and working with Robert Bosch for the continent of Africa. Coming from the private sector, I like to be very pragmatic. I agree with the fact that you said we shouldn't repeat the same mistake. Because obviously, if you do what you ever done, you will always get what you got before. And you mentioned policies need to be in place my question is, why we did those mistakes in the past? Is it because when they buy the minerals for $1, oh wow, $1, that's more than enough for us, we take it. Or because minerals look like paper, no, take it, we don't know the value. And then they sell it back to us at a higher price. Why we did those mistakes before? This is my question. Right. Let's take a few more questions and then yes, ma'am. Thank you. Magda Raval is my name from the Institute of Global Health and Development. Uh, listening to you, it seems like Africa and Latin America are going through the same struggles and doing the same mistakes. Where do we come together to learn from each other and then try to jumpstart and um, move forward? Um, maybe one more question, then I'll t turn back. Is there anybody else who uh, would like to? Yes, please. So I'm sure you talked about uh, the collation that you were proposing for uh, the minerals belt. What are the main barriers standing between you and having that uh, a reality in 2023? I think there is absolutely a global need for that kind of an action across the globe, or actually an action where it will allow Global South to build advanced industrialization assets across board being and science and technologies and R&Ds and everything that is supposed to be built uh, in terms of an infrastructural units. We talked today about the TPIs, right? The digital public infrastructure. Building these R&Ds and this kind of industrial correlation is considered part of the public infrastructure that is needed actually. So what are your barriers and how would this become a reality in the future from your perspective? Uh, great questions all. Uh, thank you. Maybe you can turn uh, to you first. Well, let me first address the question of Africa and Latin America. I have worked in, in, in Africa for many years. The more I understood Africa, the more, more I understood Latin America. So we, we need to get that. And I, I will say President Lula is one of the few in our region who got that. And he really reached out to Africa. He opened so many embassies to establish partnership, relationship, trade, and, and you name it. So I think when we talk Global South, often we don't mean it. Africa is Global South, Latin America is Global South. We must come together. On the question regarding uh, us creating this OPEP-like uh, 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 organization, I have to say there is already one that has been established, but not by the producers, but the ones who are interested in the product. And I think the president said it right. We need to be able to put our differences aside and our very, very narrow interest and think bigger because that goes to the first question. What is the problem? The problem we have had is that we never saw these issues as long-term <coughs> questions. We saw the, we took them in an opportunistic approach short-term. And that's when you don't think right. If we are able to bring together the interest, and, and that should go beyond lithium, I will say, of this rare earth and bring together 
all those countries that have an, a real interest and design a model which is good for everybody, that will be a killer. And I think that's exactly what we need to do. Yes, Ruba, thank you. Uh, on the three questions, uh, first on, the, on this belt that I was talking about, it's interesting. I was in China a long time ago before COVID. I, I'll, I'll go back soon, but I haven't been there in a while. And I told them the place where we need a belt and road is exactly in the south of South America. <laughs> between, if there's a triangle, right, between Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, where 60% or more of the lithium is, and that's where you need the belt and road that goes across the Atlantic and the Pacific, and you spread out there. This is where I'm going to build cell phone batteries, this is where I'm going to need computer batteries, recharger batteries, car batteries, motorcycle batteries, and, 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 and what have you, and, and, and do that. That's when we need a, a belt and road in that part of the world. A second question, which was the first one from Dominique on the boom and bust, what can I tell you, is the sad history of a natural resource commodity driven um, pendulum that we've had in Latin America and Africa. When the prices are high, you seize the government, you take the riches, uh, people steal a lot of it, unfortunately, and when the prices go down, you got to talk to the IMF, you got to adjust the tariffs, you got to do the reforms, and it happens time and again and again. And then that leads to the cycles that we have in Latin America, and maybe perhaps in Africa, of statism versus market opening. So it seems like we go from one side to the other, to the other across history, instead of finding a, a middle way where you can have, like in, in a European or in Asia, they found a center right, center left, like a railway, and then you can move and switch governments, but then you keep moving forward as opposed to uh, going back and forth without ever making much, much progress. But I think lithium, amongst other products, is, is sort of a one, one issue where we, can, we have that chance. Are we just going to compete to see who sells cheaper lithium to China or the Europeans or the Americans and then bid farewell to that? And then what are we going to do? Wait for the Martians one time to come down 30 years from now? Too late. This is a, an opportunity we have. And I'll close with the point that was made, the question that Susana was mentioning, Latin America and Africa. Why do we not coordinate? I will tell you why. Because we don't have enough Kigalis. We need a heck of a lot more Kigalis. I can tell you that most of the time, the gatherings that I go to, perhaps Susanna has a lot more experience in the UN, but the gatherings that I am invited to are always organized by Europeans. And the, I met ORF in Berlin. Good, now, now we're here There's, we're without uh, European intermediation, shall we say. We generally wait, it's, it's like flying. The, the times that I've been to Kenya or Uganda to help them on debt, because we did debt relief in Bolivia, you have to go from Bolivia all the way up to Europe and down to Africa. This time I was so happy because I was coming on the flight from Sao Paulo to Addis Ababa thinking, oh my God, I'm not going to cross the equator. I'm going to be south of the equator. And then I saw the map and then, oh no, Addis Ababa is a little bit north, but, but I came back down very soon. That's what we need. That's what we need. More of that integration. And when you go to gatherings like the G20, you know, the G7 always meets ahead of time. They just met in Japan. They coordinate their agendas. And they talk about all the things that's important to them, including jacking up interest rates that are sucking up all the liquidity from Latin America and Africa. And where do we have India and China and Brazil and Mexico and Argentina talking together? We should form a, take out this G7 plus European Union, that's eight. Let's take out, let's leave the Spanish out. They have the 21st seat, which is kind of, I don't know how they got it. But 20 minus 8, 12. When we have, when they have the G7, why don't we have the G12? And talk about the South-South issues and coordinate an agenda and say, yes, okay, we are going to talk about Ukraine. Yes, we're going to talk about the South China Sea, but we want to talk about trade, development, IMF reform, World Bank reform, energy, technology, and have our own South-South agenda. I can tell you, this type of forum like Kigali, for who's organizing the next one? Uh, from India, where does it go? Brazil? Brazil. Uh, Brazil. I'm going to tell my Brazilian friends, do exactly this with government officials. Just ask the African representatives to have talked previously to the African Union. Ask Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, I will, to talk to the rest of Latin America and represent your regional point of view, and then we can mesh this network of South-South cooperation that will help us uh, move forward.
Well, it's, it's not often that a panel ends with spontaneous applause, but uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're out of time, but thank you so much for what has been a really stimulating short conversation. Mm -hmm.